So what's the benefit of being playful at work? Well, we're going to run another poll and ask you, because I want to explain the importance of playfulness at work. Where are you usually? Close your eyes for a second, and then you'll see the poll. Where are you usually, and what are you doing when you get your best ideas? Are you in the shower? Are you jogging? Are you commuting? Are you just falling asleep or waking up? Are you hard at work at the desk? So we're going to take a look at the poll. We're going to run it for about right. another five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Closing the poll and sharing the results. And shocker, we just need to bring showers to the office and we can have best I better ideas or beds or jogging machines. But the only statistic that counts is the one at the bottom. Nobody has their best ideas at work. Well, that's a bummer because you're paid to have big ideas at work. Well, so, gosh, close your eyes for a moment. Picture that last verbal argument you were in with somebody. You storm away from the argument. You're really angry at them. And about 30 seconds after the argument, just as you're leaving, using the chat again, what just popped into your head? 30 seconds as you're walking away from the argument, just totally spontaneously popped straight in. <laughs> and I'm looking at the chats. Best response, the best comeback. The killer one-liner, that one perfect, beautiful line you, you wished you'd used during the argument, right? But it never comes to you during the argument. Why? Because in an argument, your brain is very busy defending itself. In your office, emails, presentations, Outlook, Zoom. And I hear myself say, I don't have time to think. But the split second you gave yourself time to think, you stepped into the shower, big idea. So how, how do you get there on demand? By being playful. Why? Because this is what your brain looks like on any given day. It's remarkably busy. And we found ourselves in what I call busy beta, the brain state where the door between your conscious and subconscious brain is firmly closed. But 87% of your brain is subconscious, so you're only working with 13% of the capacity of your brain. But the moment you step into the shower, that door opens just wide enough. You can still make an informed decision, but still have a big idea. So how do I get you there on demand? I run an energizer, the same sort of energizer we ran at the beginning of this session, which lasts about 60 seconds, specifically designed to make you laugh. Why? Because the moment I hear laughter, I know I've opened the door between your conscious and subconscious brain. Now, for those of you who said falling asleep or waking up, that brain state is thoughtful theta. And so it was practiced by Thomas Edison. He used to fall asleep at night in an armchair with a penny between his knees, a tin tray on the floor. And as his muscles would relax, the penny would drop, it would make a noise, it would wake him up, and he would write down whatever he was thinking. And if you're one of those people who gets their best ideas as you're falling asleep or waking up, just keep a notepad by the bed because you promise yourself you won't forget it by the morning, but we all know that you do. Um, the other thing is, if you're working on a challenge, remote or real, um, brief in the challenge five or six days in advance, because we know, hope people will have a shower, we know they're gonna go jogging, we know they're gonna fall asleep, where they are when they have their best ideas. Um, we say we're going back to business as usual. No, you're not. 12 months ago, you used to go to restaurants. Now it's Uber Eats, supermarkets, Instacart, uh, movie theaters, Netflix and Disney Plus, gyms, Peloton, offices, Zoom. Are we going back? No. In the frequency with which we used to, not a chance. Multiply that by virtual reality and where that's going. Oculus and Microsoft HoloLens have said that big bulky thing will be a pair of lenses in less than 12 months from today. 15 years since 2005, bird flu, Ebola, H1N1, SARS and COVID. Three years from now, I don't know if it'll be global or regional, but it will send us virtual quicker than you can blink. And you can either get out in front of it or get behind it. Um, 12 months ago, this was a bedroom. Today, it's a full broadcast television studio. I can broadcast in 37 different languages simultaneously through an artificial intelligence robot. And I've done several workshops now in virtual reality where a lady from Johannesburg walked right up to me in Orlando and handed me a virtual pen with a virtual hand that didn't exist. I took it out of her virtual hand, wrote on a virtual post-it note and handed her back the pen. <laughs> It's like it's a whole new world, right? Um, so we say that um, in the next decade, a third of the jobs in North America, at least, and probably in the Western world, will be eliminated by AI. Well, how will we keep, compete with AI? Well, you were all born creative. You didn't play with the toy. You played with the box that it came in. You used to ask why, why, and why again until you got a job and you were told to stop asking why because there's only one right answer. You use your intuition. You have 100 billion neurons here and 100 million neurons here. You were born with it. You have that weird dream about England winning the World Cup. It's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing. I've worked with two or three AI experts and I've asked them, do you believe that you will be able to program these traits any time in the next 10 years? And the answer is no. And that's why Nick told us these will be the most employable skill sets the next day, simply because they can't be programmed. Mm -hmm.